Hi Church, welcome to our online gathering today. I'm Pastor Jackie, a big warm welcome to you. I'm glad that you've joined with us. Um, I want to begin today just with a very short encouragement and it is this, God is good. If you're going through something at the moment, I want you to, to grab hold of that simple truth, God is good and he has everything under control, amen. For our message today, I want to share the second part um, in a message that I they shared last week called Outside the Camp. So this is part two of Outside the Camp. And um, I shared from a passage of scripture found in Exodus 33 that God gave me in relation to our vision um, for Grace Church for 2021, our community, that we would meet and gather in different places and spaces um, around our community outside the camp. And I shared that message last week, but this week what I want to do is to dig in more into Exodus 33 in terms of um, a biblical perspective or biblical truth that God had shown me through that journey. Um, I love to be able to explore the text because it is alive and active. His word just gives us so much. It's, there's so much richness to it. So today um, we're going to continue on outside the camp part two and um, draw out some of those truths from a new covenant perspective. So I can't wait to do, with that, do that with you in a moment, church. But first, let's read our scripture. The scriptures come from Exodus 33, verse 7 to 11. Now Moses used to take a tent and pitch it outside the camp some distance away, calling it the tent of meeting. Anyone inquiring of the Lord would go to the tent of meeting outside the camp. And whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people rose and stood at the entrances to their tents, watching Moses until he entered the tent. As Moses went into the tent, the pillar of cloud would come down and stay at the entrance while the Lord spoke with Moses. Whenever the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance to the tent, they all stood and worshipped, each at the entrance to their tent. The Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. Then Moses would return to the camp, but his young aide, Joshua, son of Nun, did not leave the tent. Now, what I like about that um, passage of scripture, there's so much truth in their church, but what God um, kind of drew my attention to that seemed out of place almost was um, the first thing that I noticed was that last part there in verse 11 says, um, his young aide, Joshua, son of Nun, did not leave the tent. And I kind of found that very intriguing. Why was Joshua in the tent? Why was he there? Because, you know, what I know about God meeting um, with Moses face to face was that he alone um, met with God. Um, he quite often God would say, do not let the people come near the bottom of the mountain even. And I know at one point Aaron was allowed up. God called him up. But um, generally, Moses was the only one who could meet with God face to face um, in that situation in the desert and Mount Sinai. So I thought, that's quite interesting. Why was Joshua there? Why was he in the tent? And why didn't he leave as Moses left um, each time? So that's kind of where we start today's um, digging in, I guess, church. Um, so Joshua there in a sense, has a bit part, a cameo, if you will, in that passage. Um, and it reminded me also another passage of scripture that I'm going to read now um, about the stoning of Stephen. And um, it comes from Acts 7 verse 58. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And so we just kind of get this glimpse. Here's um, Stephen being stoned by um, the Pharisees and Sadducees, the, the leaders of the day, the religious leaders of the day. Uh, and then there's this kind of throwaway comment um, where the garments were laid at the feet of a young man named Saul. So Saul here has a bit part in his story right there as well. But we know that um, whenever there's a bit part, God introduces a character, a person in the Bible 
um, quite often it, it is part of a bigger picture. And we know that um, Saul later became Paul and he had a significant role in the history um, of Christianity going out to the Gentiles and throughout the world. So this bit part became something bigger. And so too is it true um, as we read about Joshua here um, in that verse 11 from Exodus 33 that his young aide, Joshua son of Nun, did not leave the tent. It's a bit part in a bigger picture and we learn um, more and more about Joshua as we read into Exodus and um, continue through the Bible. Um, so I want to start there, church. Um, so we're going to investigate Joshua a little bit more. So the name Joshua in Hebrew is Yehoshua, um, as interpreted as Yahweh is salvation. And we know that Jesus in Hebrew is Yeshua, so Yehoshua and Yeshua. And Yeshua means the Lord is salvation. So in the Bible, when we see um, those kinds of things tying together, a bit of a thread that we're following, um, we, we call those types. And so Joshua is a type um, of Jesus. And um, I love that God threads those weaves throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. And, and the reason he does that primarily is to show us his son, to show us some aspect or some attribute or some um, beautiful thing about his son, Jesus, because Jesus was the plan all along. There was no plan B. Jesus was the plan um, for redemption for all of mankind. Um, and I love that because it just shows us the most amazing intricacy of our creator. Everything in the Bible has a plan and a purpose. And ultimately, the Bible points to Jesus, the Messiah. And so um, it's really exciting when you dig in and you find out some of those truths. So let's look at Joshua in terms of a historical context then and, and look at his genealogy. So when we look at Joshua, his genealogy can actually be traced back um, to the tribe of Ephraim. And um, Ephraim was the second born son of Joseph and his Egyptian wife. Um, it, it comes from the time when Joseph, as we know his story, um, was in Egypt and he was the vizier, the person that was the, the second highest ranked person apart from um, Pharaoh in the land at that time. And so Joseph took a wife, she was an Egyptian, so a Gentile, not an Israelite. Um, and so um, in that season where he was vizier, he had two children, the first being Manasseh and the second being Ephraim. So Joshua's genealogy comes um, from Ephraim. And um, Manasseh, the firstborn son, uh, Joseph's firstborn son, Manasseh, um, his name means um, cause to forget. And Ephraim, his name, he was the second born, his name means doubly fruitful. And so here God's trying to show us, he's contrasting these two uh, sons and these two names. And um, the firstborn Manasseh means cause to forget. And um, Manasseh is a, is a type, if you will, of the old covenant. And um, Ephraim, meaning doubly fruitful, um, is a type of the new covenant of grace. So here we see law and grace contrasted. And God does that quite a lot through different stories. We know about um, Jacob and Esau and Mary and Martha. There's many um, different stories that you can look in the Bible to see where he contrasts. If you look with new covenant eyes, um, he contrasts law and grace. So um, it's really interesting if you dig in a little bit deeper. So in Genesis 48, we read about how Joseph, Joseph's father, Jacob, adopts Ephraim and Manasseh. Um, he adopts them into his family and he uh, prays a blessing over them. Um, but instead of blessing the firstborn, who always gets the double portion of blessing, the, the firstborn would inherit the double portion of blessing. And Manasseh was supposed to get that. And remember, Manasseh represents the law here. But um, Jacob does something a little bit tricky. And Joseph is not happy about it if you read the, the account there. But um, what he does, Jacob deliberately crosses over his arms and he lays hands on Ephraim, the doubly fruitful, and he blesses the second born with that double portion um, firstborn blessing. And Joseph's not happy about it, but um, Jacob says, I've done what I've done. And so he lays his hand on um, Ephraim 
and Manasseh as he crosses them over and he prays the firstborn blessing over Ephraim instead of Manasseh. So we read that here now in Genesis 48 verse 20. So Jacob blessed the boys that day with this blessing. The people of Israel will use your names when they give a blessing. They will say, may God make you as prosperous as Ephraim and Manasseh. In this way, Jacob put Ephraim ahead of Manasseh. And that's what I want you to get a hold of their church. The doubly fruitful is ahead of um, Manasseh cause to forget. So the doubly fruitful being Ephraim, okay, is ahead. The grace is ahead um, of the law. And so um, it's really interesting because grace um, always brings life and fruitfulness and law brings death. And I love that um, God contrasts those two there, that um, Ephraim is ahead of Manasseh or grace is ahead of the law. Grace is always greater. Amen. Um, it's also here that we see how Jacob, um, he adopts the, um, the boys, Ephraim and Manasseh, into his family. Now, we know Joseph married an Egyptian woman, a Gentile. So that meant that the sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, are not uh, true Israelites. And so what, e what Jacob does is he prays this blessing and he says, I'm going to uh, adopt them into my family. And so it's um, like he's grafting them into his family. And he grafts them into the promises and the blessings of the forefathers of Abraham, Isaac, and of course, Jacob is speaking the blessing. So what he's in fact doing is he's grafting them into his family and into the promises and into the blessings that um, God would have um, for the Israelite people. And I love that because he then bestows that birthright blessing. No longer are they outside um, of the blessing because he brings them in, he grafts them into his family and he's able to bestow that birthright blessing. And um, I find that very interesting because it parallels with us because we are Gentiles grafted into the family of God and we're grafted in because of Jesus because of what he did at the cross because of the finished work and I love that we then um, like uh, Ephraim and Manasseh we then are bestowed the birthright blessings through Jesus we can hold on to the promises and the blessings because we are children of God grafted in through Jesus and um, we receive that double portion like Ephraim um, and how amazing is that that we are grafted into the family of God and our inheritance is found in Christ Jesus. It's really exciting. So let's read from Ephesians 1 verse 5. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do and it gave him great pleasure. I love that scripture. I love the fact that um, God is delighted to bring us into his family. That's our beautiful Ava. So let's continue now in looking at Joshua. So as we read in Ex Exodus 33, um, it names Joshua as the son of Nun. Now, in the Hebrew alphabet, the 14th letter is that word there, Nun. And um, Nun has the picture of seed activity and um, life it's also a picture of a fish and it has attributes attached to it like to continue to multiply um, offspring or heir so Joshua we know that name Joshua means Yahweh is salvation um, is the son of Nun okay so salvation is continuing we see that word there continuing to multiply continue to um, to bring life and um, an air and that comes through Jesus we know that and so um, I love that it talks about that continuation it continue the continuation of the seed or the continuation of life comes through Jesus and then we know it's not a natural um, continuation it's a supernatural continuation because of Jesus is the son of God and um, there's also that word there son and you may know this already but the word son in Hebrew is the word ben but it comes from a root word called bana and um, 
the, in the context of Bana, a son, it's, um, a son is a builder of the family name. And that's exactly what Jesus does. He continues um, the life, the, um, the seed, the offspring, the heir, but it's in a spiritual continuation, not a natural one. And so John 10, 10 says, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. And so that's exactly what Jesus does. Jesus continues life. Um, we have no, no death anymore, no eternal death anymore because we have the life of Jesus living inside of us. Um, praise Jesus. That's awesome. Nun is also interesting as it has the numerical value of 50. And um, 50 is the number that represents the year of Jubilee. Um, freedom and a state of redemption. So I love that that is attached to Yahweh's salvation, that, um, that the continuation is in freedom because that's exactly what Jesus brings us. So as we read last week in that scripture, Luke 4 verse 18 to 19, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Amen. So as we continue through um, the book of Exodus, we read that Joshua was, Joshua was later to um, be one of the 12 spies who entered into the promised land. Um, Moses sent them out as spies to bring back a report of what they saw and what they found. And so um, we know that story quite well. So Joshua was one of those spies. Um, so a man from each of the tribes of Israel, there are 12 tribes, each of the um, tribes was to have a man representing them. And so Joshua represented the tribe of Ephraim, that doubly fruitful as we shared before. And so um, another man that we maybe we're familiar with is Caleb. And Caleb too was one of the men one of, that was selected from a tribe as a spy to go into that promised land on that mission that Moses had for them. Um, and Caleb was selected to represent the tribe of Judah, um, which means praise. And so there's some interesting ties that I'm going to talk about now. So Joshua um, came from Ephraim. He represented Ephraim, doubly fruitful. And Caleb represented the tribe of Judah, which means praise. And um, both Joshua and Caleb were the only two that came back with a positive report for Moses. They came back from the promised land and had... Um, um, amazing things to say about what they saw and the, um, the favor of God um, at that time. And it's interesting because if you look at the tribes that they came from, one is doubly fruitful and one is praise. And so what God's trying to show us their church is to always have a positive report on our lips of the good things God's doing doubly fruitful praise. Make sure that praise is always on your lips. The fruit of praise is always on your lips. Um, the interesting thing is that the other 10 men from the tribes um, brought back a woe is me report. Um, they brought back fear. They were full of fear and um, they created mumblings around the rest of the camp. And then those mumblings continued from camp to camp bringing fear and it caused the people to rebel against Moses and against God. Um, and because of this, God struck those 10 down dead with a plague. And um, at that time, you know, there was obviously fear happening and then they were struck down. And only Caleb and Joshua were the two, were two um, people, the two men were uh, from the spies that were sent out, were the only two to survive. Um, but then God begins to speak. So after they're, not, they're cast down by the plague, God then begins to speak to Joshua and Caleb and he sets them apart from the rest of the Israelite people um, because they were the only two that had the fruit of praise on their lips. And so they were the only two that God um, allowed into the promised land. So only two from that whole generation that would then eventually enter into the promised land. And I find that really interesting church because that doubly fruitful and that praise. Um, Joshua represents the um, salvation 
they were the only ones to enter into that promised land and it really parallels with the New Testament um, scriptures that we can read in the New Testament that reflect the inheritance that is found in Jesus Philippians 1 verse 11 says may you always be filled with the fruit of your salvation the righteous character produced in your life by Jesus Christ for this will bring much glory and praise to God Hebrews 13, 15. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. I love that. So let's head back to Exodus 33 again. And when we do, we see that Moses would come and go from the tent to speak with God. Um, we know that Moses would head out to the tent. We read that in Exodus 33. And as he went, the people would watch and see what would happen. And then the pillar of cloud would descend upon the tent and and God and Moses would meet as friends face to face and communicate and enjoy fellowship. Um, so here in this situation, um, the, the pillar of cloud descended, but then went again, descended and went and then went. Um, so Moses, as we know, received the law on Mount Sinai. And so Moses is a type like Joshua was a type of Jesus. Moses is a type in the Bible representing the law. He received the law to give to the people. And so um, he represents the old covenant. And um, so we know that in that season of the old covenant, the, the presence of God or the spirit of God would come and go and so that's what happened people could not experience the intimacy that we have church under the new covenant of grace where the spirit does not come and go instead the spirit lives inside of each one of us who have asked Jesus into our heart so at that point of salvation we're sealed with the Holy Spirit and the presence of God comes on us but he does not leave he's not like that pillar of cloud that leaves again the presence of God, the spirit of God lives and dwells inside of us. And it's really exciting to see that parallel um, between the old covenant and the new covenant. Remember, church, the Holy Spirit never leaves us. Amen. Um, also in that part of that scripture in Exodus, um, the people witnessed the cloud as it came and went. They stood from the sidelines, but you and I, we, ha we don't stand at the sidelines. We actually um, receive the Holy Spirit for ourselves and how exciting is that. Um, but the interesting thing is the tent where uh, Moses went to meet um, God was just a tent. It only became um, something of importance or holy because the presence of God was there. And um, I love that because church, it reminds us that um, we have, we house the Holy Spirit. And so because we house the Holy Spirit, the very presence of God, we too are holy, perfect and righteous. Not because of anything that you have done, not because of anything I have done, but because of what Jesus has done and because Jesus lives in us, we are in Christ. We too are holy like that tent of meeting. We too are holy because we house uh, the Holy Spirit. Amen. So let's have a look now at verse 11, that, that where we all started right back at the start there. Verse 11, the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. Then Moses would return to the camp. But his young aide, Joshua, son of Nun, did not leave the tent. And that part of the scripture, as I said earlier, really intrigued me that Joshua, son of Nun, did not leave the tent. Moses left the tent. The presence of God left the tent. But why did Joshua stay in the tent? He didn't leave, it says there. He did not leave the tent. And so it kind of intrigued me. Um, but as we have seen already, Joshua is a type of Jesus and he represents the new covenant of grace in this story. Um, Yahweh is salvation. Jesus is salvation. And Jesus is the continuation of that seed or the continuation of that life. Um, there, are, there is fruitfulness and blessing and praise um, under grace. And so that will continue under grace because of the finished work of Jesus. His presence never leaves us. And that is under grace. 
And um, we now get to speak to our beautiful God face to face, like Moses did in the tent. No one else. They had to stand back and look um, from afar. But church, you have the very presence of God with you. And we know that when Jesus died on the cross and the, the veil was torn in two, it just made a way for us to enter into that throne room and to meet with our beautiful Abba face to face um, as a friend. And I love that he never leaves us and we never leave his presence. Um, so after Moses died, this is an interesting church. So after Moses died, remembering that Moses represents the old covenant of the law. After Moses died, Joshua succeeded him as leader. He led the Israelite people. Moses died and then Joshua led the people. So the old covenant died and then the new covenant led the people. I love that. So here we see the passing away of the old covenant. Moses died passing away. The old covenant of the law passed away and the new covenant of grace continued to bring life, continued with salvation and continued to fulfill the promises of the forefathers that were given through Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, that we would be a blessed people, that, we, that God would be our God and we would be blessed. And um, it's so exciting that um, God shows us these pictures in um, this passage of scripture. Hebrews 8.13 says, when God speaks of a new covenant, it means he has made the first one obsolete. It is now out of date and will soon disappear. So Moses led the people from Egypt to the promised land. That was his purpose, to lead the people out of slavery. And he led them out of slavery into the prom uh, to this edge of the promised land. He brought them out of slavery and that's what the law does. The law was always designed to bring us to the point where we recognized our need for a savior, that we could no longer carry the bondage of sin. It was We were slaves to sin. And so Moses is like that. He, he brought the people out of slavery to the edge of the promised land. But Moses, the law could not take us into the prom promised land church. And um, that's where Joshua comes in. Joshua was one was the one to lead the people into the freedom of the promised land. And um, that's what the new covenant of grace does. It leads us into the promises, the blessings found in the riches of Christ Jesus. And we are brought into freedom. We are brought into the jubilee that I shared about that nun being um, the numerical value of jubilee. He brings us into freedom. Amen. Now, church, I hope that you got something out of that today. Um, we're going to finish today, um, our gathering today, just worshipping our beautiful God with a beautiful song called Jubilee. Have a great week. Know that you are loved deeply by God and that Wayne and I are praying for you. Bless you, church.